Okay, thank you for having me today. And I will try to present uh, the paper briefly. It has some technical bits uh, that I will not go into much detail of. Uh, but of course, I'm, I'm open to, to any discussion of this. Uh, I will roughly describe the idea and the, uh, and the background, uh, which may be necessary a little bit uh, here but I, I cannot find my PowerPoint window right now. Okay. So let me uh, Okay, how can I share the screen? Okay, it is here. Okay, so here we go. So <clears throat> That paper uh, was something like 10 years in the making. And uh, you might see that it's dedicated to the memory of John Collier, uh, who uh, first uh, made me aware of uh, the work by Barweiss and Seligman that this paper owes to. But uh, of course, John is not responsible for, uh, for the idea, although I did discuss some of it over the years with him. So uh, it is something like a like a tribute to, to John. Okay, so here we go. So uh, I will uh, first uh, explain why I propose this and what is the basic, basic idea, what are the advantages and the advantages of this. So I think that is a very simple structure. So I think that it's something of a paradox here. So the, 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 ac the account is novel because nobody wanted to defend it, but it's, I think it's commonly accepted or presupposed by many people who use the notion of uh, information without really knowing that they do not mean Shannon information at all. And I don't mean uh, semantic theories of information by Floridi or Dretsky or Carnap. Uh, uh, they mean something like a correspondence theory of information, um, but they don't, there, there was, I could not find anyone expressing that idea in print, even though I went even to, to read uh, Czech cybernetics from the 60s. So I really spent some five years trying to find someone who actually ex expressed the view. But then I found out that nobody did, or at least I couldn't find it. So I had to express it myself to see if it works. Because I thought I would read the paper and see whether it works. But I had to write the paper to see whether it works. And I think it works. Um, Many people think it's hopeless, but I think it is hopeless if you if you think it uh, does too much. Uh, I don't think it is hopeless if you assign it the proper job. So uh, you could think it's a defense of a kind of encodingism. So I'm I'm putting my hat here uh, to to be cut away uh, by interactivists if they w wish to, uh, but. It's probably not the kind that they oppose to. So it is uh, the idea is not as not as provocative as it might actually seem. So what's the basic intuition here? So if you can look at the image here, uh, I in, instead of uh, uh, the infinity symbol, I'm I'm using the smiley here uh, in the in the presentation. So we have a smiley and a small, uh, which is a bigger one and a smaller one. And you might say that the, the larger raster image represents the smaller one because it's, well, visually similar. And it's not only visually similar. Uh, they share a, a similar geometrical structure. Uh, and then you could say in, in, some, uh, that in, a, in some sense, important sense, that each of them contains semantic information about the other one. So the reason why is that you can make true inferences about the larger one based on the smaller one or vice versa. So you can use one as a model for another. Uh, note that I'm, although I started with the notion of representation, I will restrict myself to the notion of semantic information because I think it's a much, uh, lower bar for semantic information. And that's uh, basically not, I don't consider this as a theory of uh, representation or mental representation at all. I consider this 
as a theory of semantic information, uh, me, uh, that is supposed to be crucially about something and has satisfaction conditions. So the idea would be that there is some kind of correspondence relation that goes on and that works, uh, that is at work here. But it might seem that it, it, it's really difficult to, to, to defend, um, as you will see in a minute. The advantages are obvious. There, there were lots of people defending similarity recently. Uh, I did write some papers with my uh, former postdoc, Pavel Gwajewski, who uh, defended his notion of structure representations. Uh, Weisberg wrote a quite an influential book on scientific models being models in virtue of similarity. Uh, his notion of similarity is based on Tversky's contrast model of similarity, which is pretty uh, uh, mainstream right now. So I think the, the advantage is that it makes uh, some fundamentals for, the, uh, for, for all these accounts that presuppose something like that, but they never make it really, really explicit. So I'm trying to make this explicit and um, that is the advantage. Uh, also, the thing is, which this, do, this piece does, is that you can understand why there is a certain allure in thinking that whenever you have information transfer and encoding, there is a correspondence and there is aboutness. And that allure hap uh, is sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit. You can find, for example, a very interesting piece by uh, uh, Alistair Isaac on Shannon information implicitly uh, uh, having some aboutness in, in BJPS recent piece. I, I think it's a very interesting take on Shannon information from the Skirmsian point of view. And there is a very similar idea that if you have an information channel, you have transferred, there is some correspondence that is related to the contents. And I think the idea is not so absurd just because uh, in, well, maybe in, in some contradistinction to what Shannon explicitly claimed, uh, his account cannot be devoid of any significance for semantic information. If it, if it was totally devoid of this, there, were, there would be no reason to have a, a, a statistical theory of information that he presented if there was no aboutness there. I mean, nobody would care to send information that is not about anything. It would be just patterns, patterns that would be not meaningful. So there is something about it. But I don't think Shannon, Shannon's theory of information is sufficient. And Isaac's uh, take is very, very uh, non-straightforward to use. And it has very limited applications. So I think there is a better way and more straightforward way to understand why, why this might be interesting. And also, if you want, you can take my idea and talk of false information. You don't have to. So I make, I make some effort in the paper to, to say that uh, you don't have to uh, reject Florides or Dretzky's uh, claim that only uh, true information is information, that false information is not really information that they, that they uh, uh, defend. I try to, to, to remain neutral on that uh, because there nothing really hinges upon that. But if you wish to, to have an account of false information, there are at least two or three ways you could use that account easily. Uh, but to have that, you probably have to get more, uh, uh, much, it, you need more assumptions than are given in the paper. So there are certain troubles uh, uh, that have to be tackled. Uh, so I will go through the troubles as simply things I want, I think they sh should be done uh, in order to defend this notion. So you have to, if you want to defend the notion of 
semantic information is based on simil uh, uh, similarity of structures, you have to say what structures it, structure is, or what are the ba basic building blocks of structures and what correspondences. And then you have to deal with uh, the uh, Goodman's ghost or uh, Watanabe's uh, uh, similar charge, uh, uh, the ugly duckling's theorem. So uh, the ugly duckling comes last. So the basic building blocks usually for theories of information uh, are most, most of the time they are simply degrees of freedom of some physical medium that makes some physical difference to a readout mechanism. Uh, I think this notion, this notion has been dubbed by uh, McKay in 1969, structure information. Gabor called it originally in 1946, logon information. Uh, However you call it, the idea is simply that you have to get some medium that has degrees of freedom. That does not mean that it has to be a, any kind of uh, um, uh, stable medium, something that is immutable. It could be changing over time. It could be as easily, uh, 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 as, as far as I can see, most of these things apply to processes rather than to, to anything uh, uh, that is stable. If it's too stable, it cannot actually change uh, uh, its status, uh, cannot actually, you cannot actually uh, uh, tweak with this degrees of freedom. So uh, something like a processual uh, media is presupposed by most of these things as uh, these approaches. And then uh, the, the crucial uh, step is to understand readout as classification of physical particulars under types. And that is a step which is uh, uh, done in, in, at the big, very beginning of Barweis and Seligman's book, which is uh, simply a book about information transfer uh, in uh, networks uh, described in, a, in special non-valid logics, but I won't use those non-valid logics uh, later on. So basically we can use classifications uh, here. Uh, you, you can see a definition here. You, you, we have a, a set of objects to be classified, which we will call tokens, a set of objects that are used to classify these tokens uh, called the types and some binary relation between those tokens and the set used to classify which tells you which tokens are classified as being of which types. That's a very, sim very simple idea of classification. Uh, so basically, uh, whenever you can classify those things uh, during a readout, you can, you can uh, get to a basic building block of, of my account. Uh, so we go to some understanding types. That is a tiny little bit over and above degree of freedom because you have some types of degrees of freedom instead of simply tokens. So I think it's important to understand that usually people are not interested in transferring uh, simply tokens uh, from one place to another when they transfer information, they're interested in types as involved in certain structures. This is what is important for us, not particulars, but certain abstract patterns. So we can then understand the overall structure in some way. There are different ways you could go about it. And the usual way people go about it is to think about uh, say, theoretical structures or uh, some other structures, but they open a can of worms because of one simple uh, uh, problem that was pointed by Newman to Russell, namely that this notion of structure is very, very easily uh, trivialized. Uh, Newman pointed that that notion of uh, set theoretical structure, relational structure is, uh, can be def deflated to simply and in anything which has the same uh, 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 cardinality has the same structures, which is a, fa a fatal blow to lots of structuralists who want to defend something more. So I think Newman's paper uh, uh, that de uh, defeated Russell's theory of perception should be uh, taken seriously. 
uh, if you don't want to deflate the notion of structure. Uh, some people like James Ladyman, they prefer uh, to go via homotopy theory and there is a certain uh, reason to do that. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting theory that could be used just as set theory is used uh, as a fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental theories in mathematics, but it's overkill in some ways. And it is commit, it would commit my view to some solutions, which may be not the best way. So I thought instead of actually committing myself, let's go minimal, as minimal as possible and think maybe there are actually various kinds of correspondence-based semantic information. Maybe there is not just one kind, maybe depending on the kind of similarity and depending on the kinds of structures, you could have interesting taxonomy of those types and maybe some are more interesting for certain reasons and some are uh, useful for, for some other types. And that intuition also comes from seeing that there is a plethora of ways you could measure similarity uh, that is used in information science, uh, information retrieval. Depending on your purpose, you might really have different measures and different, uh, different ways of measuring the similarity. So maybe there are multiple kinds. So I try to remain as non committal as possible so that you could be more committed by actually taking that general framework and trying to make a more committed version that would be one specific particular kind of correspondence-based semantic information that would be based on uh, whatever structure you, you need. So to be as general as possible, I simply posit that you will be classifying again. So I would be using that uh, uh, not only basic building blocks, but also larger structures would be classified as the same structure. So this structure is simply understood as yet another type that classifies other types. And that's it. How you do it, what, what is the relation whether it presupposes set theory, homotopy theory is up to, to, to the user or to, to, to someone who wants to develop this further. And in them, there might be different ordering relations in, in, uh, uh, that you might be interested in. Uh, physically, of course, that might be ordered in time. It might be ordered in space uh, uh, as we sometimes do. Uh, as, as, it's as neutral as, as you might want it to be but I don't think it's uh, too neutral. So the last building block is correspondence. So th this correspondence is simply structural similarity between structures. Uh, I think it's now a little bit uh, obvious that it, it has to be a, a, between structures. So it, it, it is by definition structural. So the the, the most difficult problem is how to be as non commental as possible without really being uh, totally uh, meaningless. So I adopted a, a generalized notion that Bar Barweiss and Seligman all already use. They use, you know, use a notion of infomorphism, but I uh, relaxed it a bit. I relaxed it a bit because they, uh, they needed a notion of ideal information transfer without any loss. There is no talk of noise. There is no talk of uh, distortion in their uh, theory. They seem to pre presuppose uh, 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 ideal information transfer. The, this is a very funny thing, which you can also find in people espousing in Xerox principle, as if Xerox was noiseless. Xerox principle is supposed to be the principle that you never lose information. Well, you do uh, when you use a Xerox, uh, you introduce noise. This is how Xerox works. Uh, so the, uh, the idea is to, to, to relax the infomorphism uh, to allow for a certain, uh, I would say non-strict uh, correspondences. So it, the, uh, the extreme case of uh, info correspondences infomorphism. 
So it's a more general notion that could be at its extreme. If it's a perfect copy, if it's a perfect correspondence, then it's an infomorphism. So basically, I, I take this idea that a kind of correspondence that we're interested in when we want to say that one structure corresponds to another is that without this correspondence, there would be no information transfer. So if there is information transfer, there has to be some correspondence. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an information transfer. That's why those ideas are so easily uh, taken together and sometimes conflated and confused. But I, I make it explicit because I see that there is a connection, which is a conceptual connect, a connection. You can use the same idea for both purposes. So what is infomorph infomorphism? The infomorphism is, is pretty much uh, a kind of morphism. Uh, so you have uh, a, a pair of functions, uh, uh, f with a caret and f with the, uh, Oh, I think it's a little bit distorted after changing the font uh, uh, with an in inverted caret and they go in one direction. So one goes from uh, one classification uh, and one is goes from uh, from classificate from A being classified by this binary relation into the set of types. It goes to uh, the set of types uh, B uh, that it cl is classified by this binary relation over tokens B. So basically, just you you have one function that uh, that g gets you uh, uh, that uh, from from structures A you get structures B, and from structures B you get uh, inverse version to structures A. It's as easy as it could be, and I think it's as, in, as intuitive as it could be. Uh, but it's a perfect uh, correspondence. I'm not interested in perfect correspondence because I'm not interested only in truth. I'm all interested also in, in something which is only very similar, maybe to some low degree. Maybe it's an imperfect copy. Uh, maybe we want to idealize things, distort things uh, uh, on purpose. That's why I want to, to get it in a different manner. So I go through a notion of a fuzzy classification. So instead of having simple sets, uh, that uh, underlie types of tokens in the original version, I go for fuzzy sets as uh, defined by Lofty Zalich in his fuzzy set theory. It's a very minimal notion. So uh, a member of a set simply uh, belongs to a set to any degree. Uh, and then I require that those functions obtain at least for some tokens and at least for some types of, uh, of both classification, both A and B. So for at least for some, so uh, not for all of them, but at least there should be at least some correspondence. It's a very low bar, very low bar. So, uh, it will be, it opens the way for being a really nasty good manian and say, you can find it anywhere. Uh, but the purpose of making this uh, uh, so liberal is that there are many more specific measures of similarity that you could use. Uh, if you wish, you could adopt the contrast uh, theory by Tversky as Weisberg did and it seems to work pretty nicely for his purposes of scientific modeling but Tversky's theory uh, seems to satisfy that it, it implies that info correspondence obtains but it would be a more constrained version of, of that 
because it would uh, require also these contrast classes and, and so on. You could go for other measures of similarity. And I think there are at least several dozen uh, formally defined uh, interesting measures of similarity that are used in data science in, in various uh, brands of information science. So uh, taking one as the only one which should fit the bill, I think it would be uh, too quick. So what happens here is that you get too many similarities, obviously. But then I turn the table and I say, well, it's not a bug. This is a feature. That's what it should be. This uh, account is not an account of how we use information, what information does. It is only an account of one tiny little bit. It's not an account of representation per se how information gets used, how it guides anything, how, it, uh, how inferences are made with that information, how it is measured. These are things that I had to put for another occasion because I wanted to have a single paper that starts with the idea. And to make it a single paper that focuses on one issue, I had to cut away lots of lots of things that would be, had to be added that uh, that if I wanted to, uh, to go into more detail. Uh, but I think there is one way you could defend that notion. Um, namely that it's not a, it's a feature is that uh, if you have a more constrained notion like Dresky's notion of information uh, which requires also covariance, which may in also uh, be seen as a form of info correspondence. I think it, it, it might be seen this way. So it's more general notion. Then certain things that happen by serendipity uh, might not be understood well. And I want to understand how these things might work, that we discover certain similarities and then we make inferences based on these things. Uh, but we don't have to be committed to the fact that this is a, the most reliable form of information. Still, it is used as a model for something else. So it is about something else. So if you take this, uh, probably totally uh, fake idea of uh, the dream about the Ouroboros and the benzene. That's probably not even true. But if it, even if the guy had a dream, of course, the Ouroboros doesn't even exist. But the structural similarity, if he actually would make an inference, it would be just serendipity that it actually matches the structure. But if he is able to make inferences based on one model, on one structure, that would be true of any other structure, I think it should be understood, in, at least in some framework, as carrying semantic information about that other thing. And my account does that. But it does not say uh, what representation especially with a, with a uppercase R is. It says what you, how you can think of certain things being about and other things if they are structurally similar to one another and how people can use them. So the, the problem of too, man, too many similarities is present, but it's not a huge deal given uh, uh, the liberal liberality and generality of the proposed account. But if you go to some more constrained notions, you might constrain this as, uh, as you wish. So in some constrained notion, specific kind of correspondence information, a lot of uh, liberality might be gone. So you might, for example, you might decide that there is no false information you might decide that uh, uh, you were you would be using only Tversky's uh, uh, model, and then some of the things that would count as info correspondence wouldn't count as semantic information in your Tversky style 
correspondence information. So I think uh, that is the idea that you can go very general and then you can have very particular accounts that make it make this idea more specific. But in, uh, in some ways you could think that this semantic information that I defend here is a very low bar on what semantic, what, how, you, how you understand semantic information. Uh, and uh, I think Mark has defended the notion that there is something like differentiation. And I think that corresponds to, to the idea of differentiation, that there are certain differences, some structure or, or process that has a certain differentiation inside. But it has no normative consequences for anything yet. I mean, it might underlie something else if it were put into place in some other process. But as such, it is a very low bar and it does not pretend to do much more. And one more uh, uh, thing that might be interesting to, to contrast, uh, namely with Dretzky's uh, natural information, which is grounded in strictly necessary covariation, which is based on natural loss. I think it's, uh, you, you can easily see that it, and everybody actually see that, uh, that this Dretzky's account uses so heavy in an artillery that you have to go for a really huge idealizations to, to believe that. So if you get even a very, I, I, I had a, some old travel photo from the pre-pandemic times of Bulgaria, so it's Nesabar, but it doesn't co-vary with Nesabar. I, I suppose there are no people right now, no tourists. And uh, probably the cafes are bankrupt. Uh, it is, but it's similar to Nesabar at some point in time. So uh, that notion of information that relies on covariance is very nice, but we have lots of things that do not change over time to covary. Sometimes they're just frozen images. They might, but they need not. So it is a much lower bar and it might be useful to have a lower bar. So no, no natural laws are uh, required. And even uh, changes in probability are not required because I assume that even with serendipity, you could have things that work as models. So maybe not very reliable models, but they might be used semantically. So that's the idea. What are, these, what are the advantages of this uh, idea, uh, except for making sense of certain uh, uh, uses of the notion of semantic information, which are a lot of users of computers definitely do share when they think of bitmaps or things like that. Uh, one thing is that there is no uh, old matching problem for correspondence theory of truth. Uh, because correspondence is not taken to be uh, a criterion of truth at all, uh, but also because uh, the correspondence here, uh, the matching problem was how to match propositions to reality. I don't have propositions as opposed to reality. I have things which are classifications, and these are the, the same kinds of things. So I have classification against the classification. So I don't have the problem that I have to match propositions, however you understand them, as opposed to the world out there, however you understand that. And I do not have those so-called funny facts that logicians uh, discovered in correspondence series of truth, especially with negation, uh, because with uh, uh, you could try to go for propositional contents this way if you want to define some pictorial semantics or something like that using this notion of correspondence uh, that I defend 
but it's not in any way required. And I think it would be hugely difficult to understand negation, for example, uh, uh, in terms of uh, mere uh, structure, uh, in terms of type spin, simply uh, subsuming certain particulars. You probably need something more, and it's a well-known problem for pictorial semantics that negation is very difficult. You probably go uh, need to go for uh, uh, some symbolic means to get that. You could probably have a hybrid structure that mixes the structures with symbolic certain representations. And I think that that is a powerful tool. Uh, the power of this, uh, I have just touched upon this when in research with my other postdoc, Mateusz Hochel, who worked on geometrical cognition. And we discovered that the power of Euclidean geometry is inherent, just as uh, Raviel Netz has uh, nicely shown, not only in diagrams, but in diagrams with symbols. So you need both uh, certain specific technical language of geometry, which is very restricted in, in Euclidean geometry. You have a very restricted vocabulary and uh, ge uh, grammatical structures uh, that operate on a limited number of symbols, which are then applied to diagrams and none of these work separately. So probably if you want to go for something much more interesting, something propositional, you need to do something like this uh, because this is not supposed to be uh, the ultimate uh, uh, answer to all your uh, questions about se uh, semantic information as such. It, it only answers questions about this particular kind of similarity based simple structure matching semantic uh, information. Now, let me try to say why I wanted to, to discuss it with you. Uh, well, I have to admit, this is not an account of representation, but I think semantic information is necessary while being insufficient for representation, including mental representation. So you, you need a lot over and above uh, semantic information, including this correspondence type of semantic information, which is not the only kind of semantic information out there. And uh, of course, Pavel uh, discussed uh, his idea of uh, structural similarity uh, and uh, Mark and uh, August responded to that. I, I feel somewhat uneasy when trying to defend Pavel's notion because he, even he changed his mind and I tried to change his mind over the years to be more liberal and to think that not only structural similarity might be uh, uh, required to get representation going, but I think the, uh, uh, the idea here is that if you have correspondence, it, you're not doomed. It might work. It might work if it's put into some specific content, context. So if you have a working mechanism that, also, uh, that already uh, makes inferences based on that kind of information, uh, makes it reliable, corrects for errors by checking for inconsistencies, things like that, it starts to look like as if it were to be uh, a defensible notion of uh, uh, representation, but it requires much more than just mere semantic information. But my point is that whenever you have encodings, it's, it's not totally unrelated to semantic information. Because if you find that there is an encoding, there might be a reason why there is an encoding. Because maybe there, are, there is a cer certain structure matching that allows a certain entity to make inferences about some other entity. That encoding might underlie those specific things and uh, especially those things that are related to what Sawyer uh, dubbed uh, surrogate reasoning. And that's not, uh, any small feat. And that is not something that uh, we should 
underestimate, although it's not the final answer and it's definitely not a complete answer to any uh, uh, questions that cognitive or neuroscience might have. And that was it for, as a short presentation, of course, the paper has more details and probably I skimmed over things that are much more critical and, uh, uh, and show that it's totally uh, unworkable, uh, but uh, you have to select things for your presentation. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Arsim. So uh, raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, I will stop and restart the recording. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Although I didn't watch it from the beginning, so I apologize if I ask something that you've already mentioned. Uh, as far as I understood it from your paper, you tried to ground semantic information on uh, similarity as basic. But then when you are talking about infomorphisms, you're using classifications, which are kind of propositional structures, because what the classification is, is a subject belonging to a type. So in that sense, the primitive is encodicism or some kind of predication, some kind of propositional structure rather than similarity. Mm. I, see, I see what you mean. Mm. And I'm not sure if I if I agree. Uh, so it's a property of type theories that they are. I I, I I I I see I see and I, I and I I know how it was put to use by Dretsky, for example, in his uh, uh, in his functional uh, information as well. So I, I can see what what you're at, uh, and. Uh, so let me make, make clear what I mean that uh, what I don't do is I do not presuppose that uh, all uh, intricacies of, of relational structures, uh, uh, whole, uh, whole structure of a proposition probably cannot be reflected in my, uh, or cannot be easily reflected in, in my account. You need much more uh, machinery to get uh, disjunction or uh, by negation uh, in, a, in a proposition to get to work. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there is no way to, to express connectors. But if you want to say that there is some basic form of predication, that probably you are right. Uh, uh, and I think this is one way to get uh, the notion uh, of abstract structure going is to, to say that there, there are types that the, there are certain particular subsumed or there's certain types and I do not see really a way out of it. Uh, but I'm not a nominalist, so I, I don't I don't really care about this. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure if it's a problem here. Uh, why would that be a problem? Because similarity obviously is not basic. What is basic is predicate argument structure or function argument structure, which is not nothing to do with similarity. Well, but if you have a classification, then it's not yet uh, sufficient for semantic information to occur. I, I assume that if you have just a, 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 a structure yeah, that, that could be repeated over and over, then it's not yet a model of anything else. Of course, you could you could say that it's a model of itself, that it's an uh, 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 morphs into morphs, so the, that you could find a morphs into the same structure. But I don't think this is. I could uh, add one condition that a is not equal to b, and then it would require a little bit more. Um, so. Of course, similarity is not the only thing. A similarity requires relata of similarity. So I decided that these would be those uh, classifications rather than anything else. And that, of course, has some costs. So I, I, I admit that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have three questions. First, Villa, then Robert, then Mark. 
Tell so thank, 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 so thank, me Lucas. Thank, thank, yeah, thanks. Um, just, I think my question is very small and maybe about terminology. I'm just trying to make sure that I, I'm following. So, so, so the thesis that there is, there are information bearing structures in reality, right? But and these somehow these are the ground or they ground uh, semantic uh, information, and the semantic information I. I guess you said several times that 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 is not representational necessarily, if I understood correctly. And uh, so my question is, uh, how do you get from information bearing structure to semantic information? What 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 is that step? I, I guess I just missed it. What is the uh, uh, presumably it's not semantic in the nature, right? say the the constellation of stars let's say a big bear it is probably not semantic right but it does have some kind of resemblance structure to bears or a bear right and we use information bearing structures like that to get the semantic information but but uh how exactly what what is what is that step yeah that's the question uh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I see your question. I understand what you mean. Uh, the idea is uh, is quite simple, that uh, it, it's the idea of the correspondence theory of truth, uh, that if you have, uh, uh, that you can understand conditions of satisfaction of uh, a piece of information or understood here in terms of structures, in terms of the uh, degrees of similarity between those structures. So, you, I defined, uh, define condition of satisfactions uh, 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 in terms of how well those structures correspond to one another. So the structure is satisfied to a certain degree if it, if uh, info correspondence obtains to a to a high degree, and if it's to a low degree, and then it's lesser satisfied. You could go for binary notion. If you don't want to have a graded one, uh, if you if you restrict yourself to perfect infomorphism, you would get a, an extreme case that it either obtains or not. If it does not obtain, it's false. If it obtains, it's it's true. But then, if if you get with falsity, you get a little bit of funny facts. But uh, that's the idea. So uh, conditions of satisfaction. Uh, are strictly constituted by the by the correspondence here, so that was the idea. Uh, I don't think it was on my slides, so uh, thanks for that. Uh, okay, Robert, your question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I wanted to. I'll just describe how I see things and uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, so, because to me, it seems that what you're proposing is more of a theory of information and less theory of um, actual se semanticity, uh, which is kind of like relates to Eleni's and uh, Vile's question. Because it seems to me that truthfulness in general, normative, uh, normative aspects of information, of representation, come from assertion that may, may be based on similarity, may be based on certain uh, information, informational structures and relations in reality, organisms do that, but uh, the content of it, the, the truth or false, falsity must inhere in the process of assertion. Uh, and in interactivism, that's the anticipatory process that does that. So um, I, uh, similarly to Ville, I, I find it problematic to see how uh, semanticity can be in those structural similarities and not in the asserting organism. Uh, so, yeah, could you uh, maybe say more about that? Yeah. Uh, well, I I think assertion is 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 something more, uh, much much higher bar and uh, something that I do not touch upon at all in, in the paper, uh, that I agree. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if it's only organisms. I, I, I'm not persuaded by 
and by the arguments that uh, you need uh, heavy functional or normative artillery to, to ground that. But uh, uh, in this paper, I, I didn't want to go into that at all. At all. Uh, I think the uh, it's as simple as, as it could be, and it's very similar. In, in some ways, it shares the fate of any any kind of um, extreme informational realism, as espoused by John Collier or or, or uh, Gretzky. There is information out there, and whether we see that or not, uh, it's out there. So uh, there are some uh, three rings. Nobody has to read them, but they're they're about the age. They tell you the they indicate the age. Whether one cuts the tree and sees that, whether the tree knows that, but it does reflect. It it corresponds to that. And I think that's the that's the idea. You you have structures that may be treated as semantic in, in so far as they could un, they could un, uh, justify true inferences about one thing based on another. So that's the notion. You could of course call it some other way, but because there is aboutness in a certain restricted sense. I think semantic information is the best notion here. And I try to make it different from, uh, from uh, representation. Uh, a similar move uh, in, a different, uh, in a different context is made by Tyler Birch, he, where he, I think he uh, distinguishes between uh, registrations and representations. In simple organisms, you might have registrations when there is just simple tracking of, of uh, uh, some magnitudes of uh, of, of 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 a, of a certain uh, sensual stimuli, but it need not be uh, yet representational in the sense that it's accurate representation being understood and asserted and denied and so on. But I don't think you might have the latter without the, the earlier. So you, you cannot have uh, representations without registrations. You cannot have representation without semantic information. So it's just a necessary condition, but not sufficient. You might, of course, say uh, assertion is the crucial bit, uh, but it, I think it becomes in, in a certain way semantic uh, or verbal, verbal uh, dispute because uh, there is a huge uh, tradition of people using the notion of semantic information to talk about things which are not necessarily related to assertion or to organisms or to human beings or anything like that, just to satisfaction conditions uh, taken in, in a very abstract manner uh, as uh, as indicators or anything like that. So I, I, I'm in that terminological tradition, but I think it's just terminological tradition. You can, you can rebrand it. If you, if you find a better term for this, I don't, I don't really care about the term, but I think there is a notion of that there is something that justifies inferences. Uh, and if it justifies inferences, it's, it's not just statistical structure. It has to be truth bearing structure or at least satisfaction condition bearing structure. That is the, that is the, the, the crux of the matter. So would it be, just a quick one. So uh, would it be to, okay to say that uh, what you're doing is actually presupposing the knower uh, and, at this, and, and what you're interested in is how the knower uh, represents reality, how it uses the structure of informational relationships in the world. And therefore, you're not interested in the theory of representation. You, 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 you presuppose it. You just assume that, okay, the similarity potentially known, and therefore it has information for the potential knower. And, and you're just not asking the question of how the knowing, potential knowing is happening. That, is, that, one, that, that is one way you could have it, but I don't have it that way. I, I'm much more realistic about it. So I think there is information, I mean, uh, uh, then it has a very beautiful uh, or even distinction between lovely and suspect uh, properties. So 
suspect properties are that, those that somebody has to suspect of something. So they're, they're, they're really heavily subject dependent. Whereas lovely properties are those that could be, uh, uh, things are, you know, nobody has to really look at something to be lovely. It is lovely in itself, but uh, it depends in some uh, weaker sense on, 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 the, on the agent. So uh, I would rather say that it's definitely not uh, uh, a suspect property in my case, the semantic information. So I do not presuppose a knower in that suspect sense. Uh, I would be reluctant to say it's lovely. I think it is a, just an objective fact that things correspond to one another, but lots of things correspond to one another because we live in a structured world. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of structure. Uh, and that's it. And though, uh, and whether anybody uses that for inferences, I don't care. People will, will yeah, but die, but the inferences will be still available. Right, but but wouldn't someone have to be making inferences in order for there to be truth and falsity? Right, like know. otherwise it's just correspondence that exists. Like it's sort of the Dretsky argument. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, those those inferences are. are you could think of them as abstract structures being made as well. Nobody has to make them in reality. You don't okay. have to think of them in a very platonic uh, way, but if you have a physical structure corresponding to other physical structure, then it's it, it just a matter of some model facts that you could make inferences about it. it you right, don't yeah. need a human subject for this or, or, or animal subject or, or UFO or anything like that or God. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I'll think about it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'll think about it. Uh, I think Mark's turn is now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, it's your turn. Okay. Um, th there's a whole lot here. Um, I'll see if I can reduce this a little bit. First of all, at a general, very general level. <clears throat> um, the interactivist model has never argued against encodings. They clearly exist. What it has always argued against is encodingism. The claim has always been that encodings are a necessarily derivative form of representing. And they can't be derivative from themselves. You get a kind of circularity uh, of begging the question there. So. At least at a at a at a you know a thirty thousand foot level, um, uh, this is not inconsistent with the interactivist model. Uh, now let me try to get a little bit more specific. Uh, I have comment on on both papers here that have a similar sort of consequence. The one paper that you outlined keeps talking about classifications and correspondences. And at, again, at a relatively superficial level, I have no disagreement with that. There are many, many possible classifications and many, many possible correspondences based on those classifications. What I would point out, I think, at several of the previous questions have kind of pointed out, is that something, uh, presumably some sort of agent, although you seem to disagree with that, has to make use of one of those correspondences and classifications that the correspondences are based on. So there seems to be an agent dependence, which sometimes you seem to acknowledge and other times try to get sort of get away from. In the other paper, a, a central reference is Conant and Ashby. And um, uh, I don't think you get Conant and Ashby be wrong per se, but I think there's a sort of misinterpretation of what they've proven that, that um, connects with something from the previous paper. And that is that Conan and Ashby in effect end up proving a necessary morphism between events of the regulator, events or actions of the regulator, and events or actions of the regulant. Those are modal. Those are possible events. Those are possible uh, actions. And the same with the previous one. The agent is making use of possible classifications and the, 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 the possible classifications are of, as you point out, actual tokens, but the tokens supposedly fit into one classification or maybe more than one, but that's a, a, a different point. Uh, 
So what I'm wanting to point out here is that the structuralism you're arguing for is a modal structuralism. It's a morphism between one class of modal possibilities and another class of modal possibilities. It is not a structuralism between two actual uh, uh, structures in the world. And you may or may not disagree with that, I can't tell, but the wordings that you use sometimes seem to be on one side of that and sometimes on the other side of it. So I, as long as we're talking about modal morphisms, uh, I'm not really in disagreement. Um, so let me point out something I mentioned last week. Um, let's see, wait a minute, let's see. Okay, um, going back to axiom systems and implicit definitions, an axiom system implicitly defines its class of models. It's a differentiator. It differentiates possible interpretations into, the, into those that are models and those that are not models. So an axiom system is neither true nor false. An axiom system is a differentiator. How do you get truth and falsity? As Robert was pointing out, you get truth and falsity in terms of connections between implicit definitions. So uh, if you can say, if you can assert, to go back to the assertion way of talking about things, that any model of um, axiom system A will also be a model of axiom system B, that could be true or that could be false. But the axiom systems themselves are neither true nor false. Um, th they are simply differentiating among modally possible interpretations. Um, uh, some other issues that show up, let's see. So this is, it, using this kind of lens, this is not a correspondence theory of truth at all. It's a correspondence theory of differentiation. Um, and one potential realm in which you might say, okay, it applies there too, and I guess I would agree with you, but you have to move to the modal realm to do it, would be to causal correspondences. So when, when Locke says only God knows essences, we only know nominal essences, and uh, perceiving, for example, was forced to be causal, um, one of my favorite examples is the neutrino count in some gold mine in North Dakota that has a causal correspondence to some fusion pro processes in the, in the sun. If you go to the modal realm of what are the possible fusion processes and what are the possible neutrino counts, you get a modal morphism again, but you have to go to the modality to do it. Um, one last realm of comment. Um, I always like Fodor for his criticisms and most of his model, in fact, I think is a criticism. It's the reductio ad absurdum of the position that he takes and he knows it. Um, he says over and over and over again, uh, uh, I would take this to be a reductio if there were any alternative. And, but the trouble is he doesn't know of an alternative and he continues to push these reductios in your face. But one thing he points out is that um, Barwise and Perry, this is earlier than Barwise and Seligman, he claims don't dis differentiate between information and available information. And it seems to, you, to me that you've made exactly the same point, but that point differentiates between information in any sort of modal correspondence sense or causal sense or otherwise, and anything mental. And I, I, again, I think that the distinction is absolutely crucial um, Fodor once said to me walking down the sidewalk and I almost fell off the sidewalk. He says, you know, I think we maybe know what content is. The real mystery is mental content. And I almost fell off the sidewalk because it was just really striking to me that he could think that content could be anything other than mental content. Um, and in that sense, one other comment from Fodor when he's talking about Barwise and Perry again, um, he says the joker in Barwise and Perry's model is attunement. The joker in He Fodor's model is encoding, although he didn't use the word encoding all that often in his writings. And he says, in the end, we have to acknowledge that we haven't the faintest clue of any naturalization of either one. And, and so it seems to me that that would apply to your way of, of doing this as well, but you haven't claimed to do the other one. Um, uh, at least not in this talk, although in your papers, it's less clear that you're not claiming to do the other one. 
So, um, okay, I, I could keep going on and on and on, but um, that's a, a, a set of comments. Okay. Uh, I think I acknowledge that uh, you would probably call it differentiation to start with. Right. So, so uh, I think that it's a, uh, I, I would think that this is exactly what it is. Uh, uh, I'm inclined to, in general to, to, to go for model realism, at least for cer certain things. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that I would go as far as Ladyman, Collier, uh, Spirit, and Ross went uh, with their everything must go uh, and their uh, dynamic realism uh, uh, there. Uh, because I, I, I believe that their view has certain dire consequences uh, but with the model realism, I, I, I believe I'm, I'm, I'm not so, uh, it does not seem to be very abhorrent. And I found their uh, argument against Van Prassen and so on uh, quite, quite consistent and interesting. So I, I'm, I'm inclined to think of this as, yeah, as available information. And I would think that it's just a necessary ingredient. So I would also, uh, uh, Think that without these kinds of differentiations, uh, or um, uh, however you, you dub them, you couldn't have a system that is able to to uh, to control its actions or to to guide its actions in an appropriate manner. So I think it's just uh, one ingredient out of many. If you if you want to go for this agent-based uh, thinking, so I would. In some ways, I'm, we're on on. Uh, almost on the same page, but using different terminology, but uh, I'm probably less inclined to do agent metaphysics uh, than you are. Uh, just, just one comment to that. Uh, I agree with you I, I, in the sense that I disagree with uh, Ladyman um, a, a lot. I also had several arguments with John, with Collier about his sort of informational realism. Uh, uh, I don't think we ever reached a resolution, but <laughs> I, I would agree that that there are senses of information that are real in the world. But again, those senses of information that are real in the world ignore the whole idea of available information and don't really address it. Yeah, I, I mean, John didn't agree with 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 Ladyman either, so he was taken out from from the cover from, of the book right. as well. Right. So about the causality mostly. Okay, yeah. uh, it's Lucas's turn and then Adrian and then Ken. Yeah, um, so my, my question was really just a finger on Eleni's question and I wasn't really sure how you, how you answered it. Um, and, and so she asked, as far as I understood her, she was worried about, aren't you just, she said something like, according to your account, similarity doesn't seem to be basic. And I was wondering what sort of worry she had there. Like, is, are you offering a sort of reductionist account of similarity? And I was just wondering, like, I mean, one thing you could say is that you're not really offering a, an account of the metaphysics of similarity. Is that, I mean, you, you're doing something else. You're offering a model of similarity, so, or a way of measuring similarity. I, I don't know. So in terms of, of not being basic, I, I'm, I'm wondering, could you say something like that? But also, I take it, if the worry is going to be something like, um, say, reducing metaphorical talk to, to, to literal talk or something, this sort of worry, then I, I take it the fact that you introduce fuzzy classifications um, and fuzzy, fuzzy typing, doesn't that push against that worry? I'm, I'm surprised you didn't say something about that as well, or is, do, you, do you think that's not relevant? Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm not so, uh, so much committed to saying that only similarity is basic. Probably to say something about similarity, you have to say lots of other things. So I'm, I'm prepared to say that it's not, uh, that I'm not presupposing just one thing. I'm probably pre presupposing lots of other things. So uh, for me, it is not a problem that requires a solution. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at classification from a very uh, abstract point of view, uh, you could call it predication in some way, uh, but in some, but 
on the other hand this is a very basic thing that lots of uh, lots of uh, uh, algorithms out there in machine learning do uh, classification uh, into types is one of the basic things that you uh, uh, use perceptrons for example uh, and that's that's not a huge deal i mean uh, Nobody would think that you need a need need a, a, an agent to do that. Uh, these are pretty mechanical things. The early perceptions were totally mechanical, and uh, so I, I don't see that as a huge of a problem. You could even think of this as as key uh, matching to a keyhole or something like that. So it's uh, it's it's a process that matches uh, uh, tokens with types, and however it works. Uh, it probably satisfies uh, uh, all my requirements. So I'm, I'm not so worried about that part. Uh, and that, that's why I didn't press on, on fuzzy classification. Fuzzy classification changes uh, in so far as that you don't get a classification that is binary, uh, yes or no, it just, you just get graded classification uh, that is no longer mappable onto uh, easy uh, classical logic, but it's mappable onto fuzzy logic. So it's still a kind of logic in, that you could use to, to model that. Yeah, I was just wondering why you didn't push that back towards Eleni, because maybe that would have been something to <laughs> overcome mm -hmm. some of the worries if the classification is not kind of a binary thing it's it doesn't seem so much like predication if it's a you know if if it's a, from zero to one <laughs> yeah um then you're not yeah yeah you're but not trying to anal yeah but I, I, I think I'm a pluralist about logic so I would consider fuzzy logic to be still quite a pretty good logic so uh all kinds of crazy non-valid logics are also logics. So you, you could you could have a logic with with a multi-valid logic. That's a Polish tradition. So yeah, sure, <laughs> you could have that. So so I, I don't think that uh, being binary is any way uh, uh, essential for being uh, 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 predicative or anything like that. So that's why I didn't didn't use that path. But uh, in in some more more classical sense, of course, yes, that that would undermine those classical views on, on binary uh, uh, true or false and uh, yes distinctions uh, that are inherent in, in classical propositional logic or things like that. Can I intervene one one tiny question? So that, do these classifications carry information according to your story? uh in themselves without yeah. uh any and uh, no i mean they don't carry semantic information they carry structural information meaning that they are structures okay. uh this is a notion that was introduced by uh by well gabor and then taken by by mckay so it's 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 not yet semantic it doesn't have uh, uh satisfaction conditions Okay. Okay, Adrian. Hi. So good to see you again <laughs> on Zoom. So as I was reading these and as you were giving your talk, I was thinking to myself, what could this possibly be applicable to other than like people doing statistics or programming AI or something? Uh, but then suddenly it hit me at the end of the talk, a couple of examples uh, that also, I think, illustrate why you end up needing something like interactivism to get into the business of normativity uh, and, and, and representation, and et cetera. Um, so the first example I thought of was, so you have, um, you have, you know, protons, protons, proteins that, that take, you know, particular kinds of molecules, right? Maybe they're, they're neurotransmitter substances, or maybe they're bacteria, and they take, uh, uh, um, they're like uh, attracted to or repelled from some, some substance, and so on, right? And um, those same receptors 
can also accept very structurally similar other molecules that may or may not be appropriate. And I was thinking about this satisfaction uh, notion that you're talking about. And, and I realized that that is a, that is a case of, um, uh, of a satisfaction where the, whatever process it is that happens as a consequence of, of the molecule um, activating the receptor or whatever the, that is, um, both the, the thing that it's supposed to be grabbing or interacting with and the things that are structurally similar to it, they all satisfy that condition, right? They all, you know, all of them set off that process or act as, I can't remember the word that you used in your, uh, when you're explaining satisfaction, there was, uh, you know, it kind of acts like an instruction, right? Um, But then at the same time, if you, if you go into the bigger picture, um, you kind of need something like interactivism to get into the normativity because not all of those molecules that, that are structurally similar are necessarily good for it, right? Like if it's supposed to be sugar and it's actually saccharin, you know, on the other hand, sometimes it is good for it, right? In the case of bacteria, they can form little specialized um, sensor arrays for types of chemicals that they haven't encountered before as a consequence of having, uh, you know, some of their receptors being uh, relatively liberal in what it is that they're willing to respond to. Um, so there's, you know, there, there's good and bad. And the, uh, but the, the, and the similarity is really the criterion for actually performing the the act, the you know, doing the response. However, you can't do normativ normativity until you start thinking about uh, how it is that that those interactions affect the the well-being of the cell, right? How it is that they what they contribute to its to its existence. Um, then, then at least from an interactive perspective. You're, now you're talking about normativity and then you can start talking about representation and all that kind of stuff. The other example was from ecological psychology. There's, uh, um, so um, Michaels and Jacobs, they uh, talk about, they, they show empirically that people are not always kind of tuned into the, the specifying ecological information. So they, they, they're able to be successful under very limited circumstances and then you kind of like open it up and it turns out they're not using the right, you know, they're, they're using a, a variable that's only successful uh, in a limited way, but they do seem to kind of uh, over time, they, they, they tune into the right variables and they're able to show what they're able to demonstrate empirically, which variables that they're, that they're using. Um, and then eventually they move to the specifying variable. Um, but again, here's another case where the whatever the the, the activity they're that they're engaged in um, relies on on certain ecological information um, in order to proceed, and there turns out to be uh, it turns out to be a non-specifying set if you're kind of local enough within the the space of of parameters for the task, right? Um, so that they're all, so that the information perhaps is structurally similar. I don't know if it is or not in terms of what variables are using, but I'm imagining that probably it has, uh, um, some, some structural similarity, but it's not identical. So the, yeah, but then again, if you want to get into the, the broader picture, if you want to get into normativity, then you have to start worrying about issues of representation and normativity. Anyway, that's my comment. Mm. Yeah, I, I believe I, I have to, to, to use cases. I didn't want to discuss them uh, uh, in my slides, not to make my presentation too long. Uh, so I, I think there are some uses. And uh, as far as ecological psychology is concerned, I remember uh, recently, uh, as editor, I, I was editing a special issue of Synthes uh, 
And there was a paper by Vincente Raja, who's defending uh, uh, resonance theory uh, uh, as relying on Gibson's ecological psychology and the resonance. Well, he was attempting to, to develop a theory of resonance. I'm not sure yeah. if he quite got it, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, the paper was growing uh, 10,000 words per every revision. So it was, uh, and at some point uh, the editor said uh, that it goes, uh, uh, above our word limits, but they had no word limits on the website, so they couldn't actually ground it in any, in any fact. So uh, there was a, uh, as special as guest editors, we, uh, we didn't get any, any hints on that. So anyway, uh, he had to remove some of that anyway. Uh, but the final thing I pressed Vincente to, to say why it is really not structural similarity and he was trying not to answer that question but uh, uh, simply avoiding the issue but I, I think it's just avoiding the issue I think you you could understand some of these uh, conceptions as uh, exactly uh, doing that uh, I, I do not claim and I do not wish to claim that it's it is sufficient to to get you to the uh, mental contents. Right, that's what you're it's saying. It's necessary, yeah. but not sufficient. So uh, I'm, I'm, I think I, uh, uh, that lots of other things uh, are required and then it's no longer a two place relation. It's at least a ternary relation with, uh, with the, uh, with the, a However, you, you you call it the thing that uses it. Uh, let's call it a consumer. Uh, it has to do something. So uh, uh, with that information, and it, and it's probably uh, uh, we need to, to talk about those uh, uh, lots of lots of other uh, interesting things. And uh, then my, the 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 probably the proof is in the pudding. So. Uh, the paper does not offer any measures of information per se because it does not go into a lot of detail. I mean, th there is one footnote that says that uh, those guys who who got uh, 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 this beautiful uh, m measures of uh, what rats are up to, uh, that there actually there was certain uh, you, you could count those things, and that uh, if you would look at details, you would see that it all corresponds to, to the conditions that I set. So you could count those things, but I didn't go into that because that is a, it's a huge topic and it's, and it's fairly difficult because it's difficult to systematize all measures of similarity that I already in use and to understand what, what other uh, measures might be even proposed in the future. Because it's, uh, I think we're only beginning to see uh, uh, that, and uh, the development in those areas is pretty fast. Because uh, we we get those big uh, data science as, as as a branch relies on that in some ways. So people are trying to to get uh, to understand those things. So uh, new new ideas uh, are being proposed, sometimes uh, rediscovered. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure it is very easy to, to develop as a separate paper. Probably it's a book series rather than a paper, unfortunately. So the, the, the question then is, is the, so there's all sorts of different situations where people talk about correspondences. The particular set of tools that you introduce in this paper, um, is this just a, a justification for thinking about correspondence or are, are the tools, the, you know, like info uh, morphisms and stuff like that, are those tools for people who are doing uh, research on, on systems that seem to be using uh, correspondence uh, or do you think that there are natural processes that are somehow uh, using these, these formalisms or whatever? Like what, what exact, what is the, um, what is the added, the, what is the bonus just besides correspondence being a thing? Well, the, the bonus is that uh, a lot of people who, who read the uh, uh, term 
semantic information to automatically think uh, Dretsky, or they think it is uh, something uh, uh, related to probability changing. And I'm arguing it's not only probability. Uh, so uh, you have to be broader than that. And that's the, that's the, the crucial bit. And that actually undermines a lot of what uh, Den Hato and Eric Mein have, have argued over the years. That actually uh, makes their argument a non-starter. I think it's a bonus. <laughs> okay, uh, Ken? Um, thank you. Uh, just now let me get rid of the stupid hand. There we go. Um, I have quite a number of comments. I'm going to try to pick just a few. I'm perfectly happy with structural isomorphisms and even with approximations amongst various structural isomorphs. That's fine with me. Um, but there's a couple of themes that keep running through the paper and through your talk that trouble me. Um, you started out, this is right off the bat, and I've got these marked by the minute I took note. Um, you indicated that information transfer is required for a box. And a few moments later, you had a quote on the slide from Barwise and Zeligman talking about readout, which also suggests um, receipt of information by transfer. And yet you talk about using one structure to make inference about another so that the one structure can be informative about the other. But that requires that the correspondence or the structural isomorphism be known. Right? Nobody can make those inferences unless they're known. Mm -hmm. And in terms of just structural isomorphisms, they're completely indefinite. I mean, either they're, you know, they're so multiple, none of them will pick out any other token at all. all right, this is part of the modal problem, but I think this is also a point at which Newman's objection to Russ wants your account of information and your repeated claims to, as you also said later, account for one structure carrying information about another. And your paper simply has no account of transfer. And so there's no aboutness unless somebody knows that the correspondent told. But by the way your paper has it set up, that will only be known in the case that the somebody who knows the correspondence actually can perceive or identify both of the structures or both of the tokens and their structural correspondence. So that there's no need to go to the second correspondent. Just look at the damn one, right? There it is, five, well, four fingers and a thumb. So you talk a lot about structures and possible similarities between them, but until you've got transfer of information and until you've got transfer of information from localized token, there's nothing informative. There's no information transfer. There's just correspondences. And at 1730, you complained about um, dress and covariance, and you had that very nice photo of Nesabar. Um, but 
the correspondences, or rather the covariances that are relevant to Dretzky's account concern our use of the effects of light, reflection, lenses, photo detectors, whether film or digital, and displays or printout. That the appearance of Nesibar varies over time, quite beside Dretzky's point. And Dretzky's Xerox principle, this is from 1725, Dretzky's Xerox principle only identifies information that is transferred despite information loss on the relevant channel. Dretzky does not resume lossless channels. So I just, the, the structural isomorphisms, fine, but there's no account of information until you've got an account of transfer and you can't have an account of transfer until you've got some kind of an account of localizing the relevant individual structure. Otherwise, you've got Newman coming at Russell and at you. So I'm sorry, I didn't find the account informative. I'm sorry. Hmm. Yeah, uh, that that problem was uh, was not answered because uh, there are several uh, papers that already do that in in. In, in various ways. So there, one of the interesting ones is uh, a paper by Duvan and, uh, oh my God, I forgot my friend's name. Uh, the name will come to me in a minute. Uh, so, uh, so they basically try to, to show that uh, there are kinds of similarity that can be bootstrapped along the way. And uh, uh, the way it works and we, what, how we do it, do it, uh, it just varies. There are various ways you could understand that. So, uh, but the, the, the important thing, the important thing is, uh, The, the most crucial thing is that you cannot have an account that would tell you how to find correspondences because that's logically impossible. And that has been proven by Tarski and he's proved that truth is not definable in, a, in an object language. If, if you could have an account of how you find correspondences in a general manner, you would, uh, you would solve the stop problem, the halting problem of, of Turing. You would also uh, solve a lot of problems that are in principle unsolvable because they are not decidable or they involve paradoxes if, if you try to go there. So I don't They're think- not soluble by merely formal means. Tarski's famous paper was on the concept of truth in deductive sciences. Sure, and I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Okay. I, 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 but I this also... is where to have an account of information, we require epistemology and a very interesting kind of cognitive science that we're getting from Mark Bickard. Thanks, Mark. Um, but just talking about structural isomorphisms can't even begin to give you an account of information. Uh, still, uh, uh... What you can think of is, or it, instead of having a general account, which is impossible to have, uh, you can have heuristics that give you those bootstrapping technologies or bootstrapping ways of getting at structures that are informative. You can start somewhere and we start to understand that these things are possible and they can work in different manners. How they do that, uh, it just varies from one use to another. And I, my job was not to offer a general theory of how knowledge is gathered. That would not be, a, 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 that is not the target of the paper. The paper is not how you know the world, how you can, under, how you can solve the induction problem, which is a very interesting problem indeed, because th this is the problem you're talking about. 
how to get induction going, how to get, get projectable properties. You this is the problem we're talking about. You repeatedly claim to have an account of outlets, one structure being informative about another, and your paper doesn't have enough structure to be informative about outlets. You, you do not want to aboutness, you want to have knowledge. This is a different thing. No, no, no. You're the one who brought in aboutness and wanted to get it just out of structural similarities. But until similarity is known, no one's got a premise by which to use one structure to infer anything about the other one. And just the fact that two structures occur doesn't make one about the other at all. They're just structures. You know, the chairs in my dining room table aren't about one another, even though they have quite close structural similarities. So you would probably go against any naturalistic theory of semantic information, including dresses. No, no, that doesn't follow at all. So what, in what respect, for example, uh, Nick, Nick Shea's theory is different? Could, could you please tell me? Because, in, I mean, probability changing seems to be quite in the same business. That doesn't begin to be specific enough to account for the aboutness. What kinds of change, how they are tracked, how information about those changes are transferred, all of that needs to be brought in. Sure, but we have other accounts that do that. Uh, you, you, can, you can go for uh, Barweiss and Seligman if you want to go for information transfer, for example. No, KF What makes it the wrong account? I'm not now going to start lecturing on Dredsky's information. I'm asking about Barwise and Seligman because that would be the, the, the natural uh, point of departure for me. For what you presented of it, it doesn't provide anything more than the correspondences. That is structural correspondences. It does provide quite a lot more because the, I presented just one or just contents of two pages out of 200. I mean, that's a, that's a rich theory that allows you to go into much more detail and lots of proofs over, the, over, the, over those things. But there is, uh, so, so I'm asking what's wrong about that theory, uh, which is, of course, uh, somewhat on the fringe of philosophy, but still considered to be quite interesting and informative by many. You don't have enough of that theory in your paper to account for how any one structure can be informative about any other structure. Okay. It, well, I do, I totally disagree, uh, but uh, I I I don't believe we can uh, we can go uh, anywhere further. Uh, so uh, I think we should leave it at that. Okay. Uh, Jet has a question. Yeah, I was actually just going to shift gears a little bit and um, ask Marcin if you would um, would you mind uh, elaborating a little bit on the contrast you draw with with Hato and Mayan? Oh yeah. So they, they claim that uh, all, uh, all naturalistic accounts of mental representation are reducible to uh, one or another version of covariance, which is, to use Mark's notion, reducible to contact rather than contents. And that's why there is no naturalistically uh, 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 doable or viable notion of contents. Whereas I'm simply saying that there is more and uh, that the arguments simply ignore uh, other kinds of uh, information that, that is out there and uh, 
even though you might think this is not uh, any silver bullet that allows you to understand all uh, cognitive uh, questions, I think it just shows that it has uh, that there is much more to uh, to how th there are many more relationships that could uh, get you uh, differentiation that could be then used to ground uh, content bearing. That would be the difference. So th there would be more of a structure, whether you call it resonance or anything. I think those those theories that go into particulars, uh, uh, they would be actually doing that work. So if I were to uh, to give it uh, an ap application, uh, a more uh, uh, something that would probably be much more uh, informative than this abstract definition, which is admittedly very minimal, and I can agree with Ken on that. Uh, but particular kinds in particular uses, that is much more interesting. And I think that would be uh, something that can be uh, uh, worked on. And I hope to, to get it uh, off the ground uh, with one of my uh, prospective PhD students who's supposed to work on uh, uh, semantics for structural uh, representations in spiking neural networks and things like that and see how it actually can support compositionality and how that actually is related to, uh, uh, to brains and things like that. So that would be more, much more detailed and less, uh, less in principle argument that may be seen as uh, uh, non-starter. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark has a question, I think, or comment? Uh, this is actually more just a comment or a meta comment, <clears throat> a kind of a generalization of a point that Morrison was making. Um, I have been struck over the years by how often I encounter uh, arguments by elimination that are not understood as such, and Hutto is a good example, that are invalid arguments by elimination. So you eliminate one possibility, and then you conclude that this other possibility must therefore be the case, but those two possibilities are not the only possibilities. And if you haven't eliminated some third or fourth or fifth possibilities, the argument by elimination doesn't work. So um, <clears throat> uh, I'm sometimes taken as uh, an anti-representationalist because I argue against encodings. Uh, so if encodings don't exist, uh, or at least if encodingism isn't true, then representation must not exist. And I, I take Marson to be pointing out that Hutto makes uh, seems to make a sort of a version of that. Um, but I, I discovered all over the place. I mean, Chalmers has an invalid argument by elimination. Uh, lots of people do. It seems to show up all over the place. And I, I caricature it by pointing out that if you conclude that phlogiston doesn't exist, it does not follow that fire doesn't exist. And um, uh, I, I, I point that example at a, at a lot of people. And I, I take it that I would be in agreement with Morrison in, a point, in pointing that at Hutto. Yeah. I, I would think that it's, it's a kind of a invalid, uh, it's an attempt to do a disjunctive syllogism. <clears throat> so unfortunately, it, uh, you would it, it it's anthematic argument that presupposes that this this uh, this is uh, the only set of possibilities that is out there and uh, yeah, exactly so it's it, it's invalid if you look at it one way and if you look at it in its presupposition of that unstated premise uh, which is generally false because those aren't the only, only possibilities then it's unsound so it's invalid unsound depending on how you construe it mm-hmm Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I, ha I have one. When will you respond to our papers? 
uh, uh, literally later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, I'm just curious. So, so, so I thought uh, that would be the, the the proper place would be to to try to uh, to say uh, uh, how we differ and where, where whether we differ because that's in a very interesting question uh, during uh, during the the, uh, the the rest of the conference so during my talk so I hope I will I will provide you with some uh, I have some notes. And I agree with lots of what you say, but uh, uh, the interesting thing is Pavo is much more pluralist now, and he he's not into the structural representations of the only things that are out there, and uh, he's much more pessimistic about the job description challenge uh, than in the past. So uh, we'll see how it goes. We. we we should be uh, probably writing up a paper, but both of us have uh, toddlers and he has a, a, a newborn coming. So uh, it's a difficult job to do that at, at the same time. Okay, okay. Oh. Thanks. Yeah, Ruth. A very quick, uh, Marcin, um, very early you were saying, uh, talking about the um, I guess theory of natural information. <laughs> I just wanted to point out that there is a, a rather complete, I think, theory of natural information in, in my recent book called Beyond Concepts. It's, it's a modification of, um, to, of um, Nick Shays, I suppose. I mean, Nick Shays is very simple, straightforward. But anyway, you might want, you might want to to look at that and, and, and what I think also is the difference, you know, the big difference between something like natural information and being a representation of, you know, what, what, what kind of move has to take place there. But, um, actually, the, this, this new, new sort of idea of, a stru of structural, uh, structural representation, I, I, think is, I think is extremely interesting, um, but it doesn't solve the same problem, really. I mean, it solves the problem of how you can learn anything about the world by working in a representational system. In other words, by, by making inferences, et cetera, et cetera, you know, how, how this could possibly help you at all in getting back to the world. And that's, of course, very interesting indeed. Oh, it doesn't solve, have anything to do, and I think this, this might have something to do with, well, I don't know. Um, it doesn't seem to have any, you know, nothing directly to do then with what makes something a representation at all, so. That's just comment. I, I wouldn't say it has nothing to do. I mean, at least in Nick's uh, uh, use, it, it does uh, uh, give a, at least one account of, of, uh, of how content might be constituted. So there is one thing, but uh, I think it's uh, as as is is in your account that there is a, a mapping between a B dance and yeah, yeah. and so on. Those mappings are are exactly the correspondences that yeah. I'm interesting. Uh, yeah, right. Interested right. in. But see that the interest that the uh, the interest there, which is very interesting, and, and that is how you can gain information about the world by thinking through things in your head, right? By using a representational system, and, and that's fascinating. And that seems to me to be what's novel in the. Uh, more contemporary view then of, of structural information that uh, doesn't tell us much about how a particular representation happens to be a representation. What it's a representation of that that doesn't seem to be uh, that doesn't seem to be said uh, in, I, in that anyway. But yeah, I, I totally agree that this paper does yeah. not give you any account of etio etiology of, of yeah. how those things uh, evolve, how they come into being, how yeah, they yeah, are stabilized, yeah, yeah. how yeah, they yeah, evolve yeah, over, yeah, over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I think this is a different different target. It's it it would then be at, at least a book or or, or a series of books. Uh, that, yeah, that's, that's great. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that as a criticism. Uh, yeah, just yeah, as yeah. a comment on, yeah, on yeah. you know uh, what what was being talked I, about here versus you know, some other things yeah. one might talk about. So thanks thanks a lot for your talk. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Marcin. Uh, any last comments, questions? If not, okay. 
I will stop the recording. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Martin. <laughs>